Time to get childish here on the exam room brought to you by the Physicians Committee. I am so excited to be welcoming our next guest to the program. They are dietitians. They are mothers. They practice what they preach. They are the founders of Plant-Based Juniors, and now they have a brand new book out. They are the authors of The Plant-Based Baby and Toddler. This is just such exciting stuff. I'm so excited to welcome Alex Kasparo and Whitney English to the exam room. Thank you guys so very much for being here. Thank you for Thanks having for us, Chuck. We're so excited to chat with you. I'm pumped that you are here too, because you bring young, fun energy <laughs> to the show. And I think that what's about to happen for the next 30 minutes or so is just going to be straight up podcast magic. We love, awesome. it. We love yeah. being called fun. We try to be cool moms <laughs> and young. over here. And young. <laughs> Uh, Keep yeah. it coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, dive right on in there. So this new book, it's kind of, you're coming along at a really good time. When we do episodes about pregnancy and plant-based diets, there is still this stigma that surrounds mm -hmm. it, like this fear that the kid isn't going to get all the nutrients that they need because they're not having dairy or meat in their diet. Um, Alex, I know that this is something that you wrestled with personally even though you were eating a plant-based diet even before you came pregnant, is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of a lot of mothers can sort of relate to this. The moment that you become responsible for for someone else's life, I think that doubt, you know, tends to creep in. I had been uh, before that uh, a plant-based dieter for you know, gosh, almost a decade before I got pregnant with my son, and then I really wanted to make sure that what I was doing was was best, you know, not, not only uh, for his for his life, but also for for mine and that that pregnancy stage as well. So. Uh, that's honestly one of the reasons that Whitney and I started Plant Based Juniors is because you know there was there was information out there, but it was sort of hard to find in one sort of easy to to navigate place. And we just felt like okay, you know, her and I both have uh, multiple degrees in nutrition, and we were having a hard time sort of combing through all of the research that was out there. We figured that there were likely a lot of other parents in a similar boat who just wanted to sort of say, no, okay, what can I do? What's sort of the the best way to to do this for for myself, but also for, for growing children as well. Yeah, plant-based juniors was really born in the DMs of Instagram <laughs> between Alex and I when I was pregnant and she was a new mom and we had all these fears. I was a bit newer to plant-based eating. I had only been doing it for about two years and we just had so many questions. And so we started turning to each other and said, you know, if we have these this many questions as nutritional professionals, imagine what, what lay people are, are dealing with. So we really wanted to share what we were learning. And that's so important because I know that there are so many different nutrition myths out there. You can go on Twitter, you can go on Instagram, Facebook, and everybody is an expert. And Whitney, especially in your background, before this, you were a reporter out in Hollywood talking to all the big celebs. And I know there's always all these big, crazy fad diets going out there. So how did you really kind of wrap your head around what is true and what is just complete fiction? Sure. So yeah, uh, reporting at E! News in Los Angeles was how I got my start. I was a broadcast journalism major. And when I came to Hollywood, I started hearing all kinds of crazy things about nutrition and fitness. People were promoting things like the cookie diet or the baby food diet, which <laughs> a lot of baby food out there isn't even adequate for babies. So um, as a journalist, I really wanted to get down to the bottom of it and learn the truth. And that's what led me to dietetics. And it was in my dietetics program going back to school and learning what the research really said about optimal nutrition, which is that a plant plant rich, plant forward, predominantly plant-based diet is ideal for health. That's where I learned the truth and, and how I came to be a plant-based eater myself. Would you believe that I actually tried the cookie diet? I, I, <laughs> Did I, you? <laughs> it was the great, I was actually paid to endorse this thing when I was doing a uh, morning radio wow. in the Washington DC area. I was paid to endorse the cookie diet and I was probably like 370 pounds at that point. And I just, the cookies were god awful. And so oh. you are actually the first person I've ever heard of outside of myself to, to, to bring this up. So <laughs> Who knows about the cookie diet? <laughs> I know, like it, it really is as insane as advertised. Alex, what are some of the crazier diets that you are familiar with? 
Oh man. I mean, I've heard them all. I think, I think the craziest diet I've ever heard is the, uh, the tapeworm diet, which is exactly how it sounds. It is this idea that you actually consume uh, a tapeworm so that the tapeworm absorbs, uh, absorbs and, and eats sort of the, the food that you're taking in. Um, obviously do not do this diet. There are, there are so many things out there. And I will sort of say too, Chuck, you know, you mentioned all of the, the myths out there just in the layperson, you know, Instagram, social media, uh, friends talking to each other. But let's not also forget the myths that also happen with nutrition professionals, especially, you know, well-meaning doctors and pediatricians. I mean, we get constant, uh, countless emails from from parents who will say things like, you know, my pediatrician says that I can't be I can't be plant based uh, if I want to be, you know, have a have a healthy pregnancy. Or uh, my pediatrician says that soy milk is not okay for kids. Or my pediatrician says that uh, my child perhaps is a little bit low in iron and therefore has to eat meat. You know, and these are a lot of these sort of pervasive questions that are out there, even from from individuals who sort of we we look to and turn to for some of our nutritional guidance. So um, there's there's a lot of a lot of myths out there that really you know we we hope to sort of bust over at Plant Based Juniors. Yeah, the Beef Council right now has a big campaign going on about pushing beef as a first food. And literally every day for the past few weeks, Alex and I have seen photos popping up in our feed from other dietitians that are that are feeding their five, six months old beef puree and trying to spread the message that uh, it's necessary, as Alex said, in order to get your babe all their nutrients. And so Alex and I spend a large majority of our time just fielding these myths. Have you been to the Beef Council website and actually seen the toddler that's being spoon fed? I'm assuming it's ground beef. We (laughs) we did an episode a couple of weeks ago. I heard that episode. Dr. Neil Barnard and and I uh, went on there and we just looked at this and we're just blown away by the material that was up there. And it was just forget the fact that I'm vegan. It was just kind of creepy to see a kid that young being spoon fed beef. Like I was always taught growing up that you shouldn't introduce those kinds of foods to a kid until they were much older than what that baby was there. And so to see this, I was like, that doesn't even seem right. And I'm checking my bias here. Yeah, it's it's very odd. And I will say, I, I think it was a few years ago, uh, back when we were all in person, I was giving a, a talk at our local Missouri uh, Dietetics Con- Associate Conference, and it was all about plant-based diets. And literally right outside the room that I was presenting was this big, you know, beef as a first food uh, place. They had the beef council there. They were sort of like promoting all of this information. I remember a few of them even came in uh, towards the end of my presentation and were, you know, trying to ask questions. I mean, it is a very ingrained sort of thought for, I think, a lot of nutrition uh, professionals that that beef is sort of this optimal food and they're really parsing out individual nutrients, right? I mean, they're looking at iron and protein status and saying, this is why. But uh, of course, there are many things that that are in beef. And the other thing that I will say, I think is so odd as a parent, you know, we read a lot of children's books. Uh, my son is now four, my daughter is one. And it is so interesting to me that so many of them, just like the word books will have, you know, cow and all of these beautiful animals in the front of the book. And then you get going and towards the back of the book, there's, you know, that same cow and now it's hamburger or, you know, chicken. And it's like, yeah, that same chicken that we just talked about how beautiful and cute it was in the beginning of the book. Now we're trying to learn these words for the food. It, it is so, so odd to me um, that just so, but I think it's such a so, you know, big part of our sort of cultural uh, vernacular. Yeah, Whitney, how do you deal with that kind of disconnect there where you, you sh- Alex was just talking about you have this beautiful picture of the animal in the front of the book and then in the back it's like, yeah, let's all eat a hamburger. Like, do you, you feel comfortable talking to your kids about, hey, you know, this is where the hamburger actually comes from and really kind of connecting the dots there? Yeah, we think that's actually the best approach if you're trying to encourage your kids to start eating or start them on a plant-based diet is really making that connection. There's so many books out there um, about loving animals and about how we treat animals as friends instead of food. And we recommend parents start reading those at an early age. It's really confusing, like, like you both said, how most of us were raised on meat and at the same time raised loving 
loving animals and where that disconnect occurred. But if you can instill from an early age um, that connection, make sure they understand it, um, it's going to help on your on your plant based journey. And also in, in just teaching your kids about the why, why we eat this way, among many reasons. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be this super, you know, graphic in in detail sort of process of what happening. You could just sort of say things like, um, you know, we 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 don't eat animals. We we love animals. You know, I, I think it doesn't have to be. Sometimes we get questions from parents, especially of younger children who will sort of say, like, how do I explain factory farming to them? Well, you don't you don't have to. You can really take sort of a, a high level approach. Like uh, even last night, my my in-laws were, were over and my mother-in-law said something to my son, like, uh, about chicken or something. And he looked at her and he said, Nana, we don't eat animals, you know, so he gets it. He's, he's four. And it's sort of this, this simple, uh, concept that he really gets that, you know, I, again, he doesn't have to know all of the details behind it. He just knows that in our home, we, we don't eat animals. I want to talk about something that I think is really cool you guys are trying to do with this book, and that is appeal to the veg curious parents, okay? Those parents that aren't vegetarian, certainly not vegan yet, but they're hearing a lot of buzz about plant-based diets, and they're exploring whether or not that this is the best idea for their family, right? So how do you guys first approach that when somebody's ready to just kind of dip their toe ever so slightly in those waters without you know, kind of scaring them off? Because it, for a lot of people, it can be such a radical idea to never eat meat, never eat dairy, never eat another animal product again. Whitney, how do you approach that without scaring everybody? Yeah, so we promote what we call a predominantly plant-based message. And that really means just the more plants, the better. And whatever way that works for your family, great. Um, I think a lot of the research coming out in the past few years shows that we really need a global dietary shift towards a more plant-based diet in order to solve all of these environmental um, and, and global economic crises that we're, that, we're, that we're dealing with right now. It's, it's not enough to have a select group of people eating a strictly plant-based diet. And so we think if we can open the door and say, however you want to come to this way of eating is great. We welcome you. Come join us. We think that that inclusive message is really going to help us all achieve our goal. And it's also going to be best for individual health as well. If you look at the research, yes, it shows that a strictly plant-based diet um, has immense benefits for health. But the research also shows that that vegetarian, that flexitarian, that even pescatarian diets also carry um, a reduced risk of many chronic diseases compared to a standard Western diet. So we don't want to dissuade people um, from joining us if they're not ready to take the full leap. Additionally, if you look at the research on, on dieting, um, jumping on board to a strict diet often doesn't work for a lot of people. It often backfires. I mean, take the cookie diet. <laughs> they were, they were going to love it. It was going to work great. Um, what, what we really see from research is that sustainable changes are what's going to produce long lasting change. So if it's sustainable for you to incorporate a meatless Monday or start doing meatless dinners, um, or just start swapping out the beef on your plate for some lentil taco meat, but continuing to have some animal products, we'd rather see you doing that than completely um, not even trying plant-based eating or trying it and then so-called falling off the wagon. And Alex, what has the reception been from your viewpoint for these veg curious parents and even parents who aren't even veg curious, but are, are hearing about this now and, and catching the buzz? Do you think that we, by and large, are, are moving more and more toward eliminating animal products from our diet? I mean, gosh, I, I personally hope so. Uh, I, I I know there is there's good research sort of showing that there is a a slow shift, right? So I think more people are hearing about the benefits of plant based eating. They're more sort of that that veg curious term that you were using. And you know, Whitney and I really celebrate this. We think that if we came out and said um, you must be strictly plant based, then we would just lose a lot of people, especially parents who do have all of those sort of societal fears in the back of their mind, uh, whether you know it's it's about iron or calcium. Or, or protein from me, I think that they a lot of times feel more assured to say, okay, yes, I know that there is a huge link between reduced chronic disease risk and plant-based diets. I also know that there perhaps is some uh, good benefits on, you know, picky eating and setting up sort of the, these lifetime of healthy habits. And of course, we all want to raise our children as healthy as possible. I, I don't think that any parent uh, doesn't have that, that overall goal for themselves. And I think that the more that we can say, 
look, the, the majority of children, the majority of adults aren't eating enough plants. So where can we get more plants on the plate? I think CDC, uh, sort of their latest statistics says that about one in 10 eat enough of the recommended amounts of produce uh, every day. And, you know, that doesn't feel like uh, enough of us are really moving towards that, that plant-based diet. So we sort of say, okay, every day, every meal, when we're sitting down using sort of our, our PB3 plate model, where can we introduce more plants on the plate? Regardless of what else you're serving, where can we really sort of shift our kids to be eating more of these healthy whole food plant-based um, items? And then, you know, when they go to grandma's, when they go to birthday parties, great. You know, we're not we're not so concerned about getting this like strictness, uh, 100% plant exclusive message. It's really about uh, come join us, come be, you know, predominantly plant-based and how can we just eat more of these these foods that we know are not only beneficial for, for growing children, but also when it comes to sort of later in life, preventing some of those chronic diseases. But let's talk about appealing, making this diet appealing to kids, because you turn on the TV, you're watching cartoons, whatever, you're bombarded with advertisements for Happy Meals and cereals and processed food that definitely is anything but vegan. Mm -hmm. Then you go out with your friends and it's, you know, ice cream here, uh, frozen yogurt, you, just so many options where you, you just the healthy diet thing just kind of goes out the window and it's marketed so marvelously to kids, this unhealthy stuff. How do you get them on board and, and enthused about the idea of not eating that kind of stuff, but instead turning to a, a healthier diet? Alex, let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, look, it's hard, right? I don't think that anyone that is raising kids right now is going to dispute the fact that wherever we go, whether it's school, whether it's a birthday party, gosh, even if I'm going to the park, you know, there's someone out there handing out whatever candy bar stuff. I mean, it's we're, our kids are constantly bombarded with these things. I think we take it from more of an approach on uh, what can we do in our home? So for instance, in, in our home, we, we try to make these foods as normal as possible, right? So my kids have been introduced to these foods at the very beginning. They have um, been introduced to, you know, soy, tofu, they eat plenty of, um, obviously lots of different fruits and vegetables, whole grains. So they know that that's sort of the, the family food. But when we go out, when we travel, when we go to grandma's house, there's a little bit more flexibility in allowing them to have those things. The other thing that we want to, you know, sort of talk about a little bit is the fact that kids are a little bit different because if we come out and also say that we can never have some of those treat foods, those really highly palatable foods, it's likely going to cause some restriction issues, right? The more that we restrict, we also know in the research that the more kids are willing to um, hide those foods, sneak them, perhaps even binge on them when they are allowed to have them. And we also want to set up sort of that healthier relationship with food as well. So, um, you know, having those those um, items in very uh, you know, different ways and, and having sort of messaging and, and talks with our kids around those foods, we think is really the best way to approach, you know, this is what our diet normally looks like, but we're not saying that you can never have some of those more highly palatable treat foods, because that's some of what being a, a kid and enjoying food is all about too. Yeah. Whitney, how do you approach this with your kids? How do you make this as appealing as possible to them without, I guess, over restrictions? Sure. Yeah. So like Alex said, <clears throat> your approach in, in, in providing these, these plant rich foods is really going to be dependent on when, um, and how old your kids are when you, when you start doing this. Uh, the research really shows that starting introducing whole foods, whole, whole fruits and vegetables early and often is key for long-term acceptance and exposure. So as soon as you start introducing solid foods at six months, you're going to want to be providing a wide variety of these whole plant foods on, on a daily basis. And even if your child isn't initially accepting them, continuing to offer them. Research shows that it can take up to 15 exposures before a baby um, may accept a certain new food. And so just continuing to offer them and offering them without pressure is really key. And this is, this is key, whether we're talking about a baby or we're talking about an older child that's transitioning to this type of diet. We see that when kids are pressured to eat a certain food, like Alex kind of said about the structure and restriction of, about sweets, uh, it's the same thing with foods that you want them to eat as well. If you are pressuring them to eat it, they're going to be a, a, a lot less likely to actually eat the food. The, the pressure backfires. Um, so we want to be providing these foods on a regular basis without pressure. And then secondly, role modeling the behavior that you want to see. So if you want your kids to be eating whole plant foods, <clears throat> you should be eating them on a regular basis and enjoying them as well. 
Okay, so that makes me think back to that old time thinking where the child was not allowed to leave the dinner table until they finished their Brussels sprouts and they would sit there for hours, basically until they had to go to school the next morning, still with the Brussels sprouts in front of them. <laughs> and and it just what you just said, it made all the sense in the world. Like that kid is going to grow up resenting Brussels yes. sprouts for the yep. rest of their life. Alex and I were both raised as members of the Clean Plate Club. And you know what happened as soon as we got away from our, our restrictive parents? We started raiding the pantries at friends' houses. And that's what we really see from the research is that restriction always backfires. Pressure always backfires. We want to take a gentle approach to nutrition where we are the leaders. We're guiding our children. But they're really making the decision at the end of the day about whether or not they're going to eat food. Yeah, we talk about this a lot in our book. It's uh, There's a feeding theory called the division of responsibility in feeding. And I think it's actually really liberating for a lot of parents because it sort of says, you know, as long as you're doing your job as sort of offering uh, these, these healthy foods often, it's really up to your children to decide how much and when they want to eat it. And we also see that this sort of like more hands-off uh, approach and really trusting our kids to figure out what's best for, for their bodies and how much they want to eat as well uh, actually leads to, to long-term success. These kids are, are more likely to choose these foods. You know, uh, it's also sort of under the same guise as we don't make a big deal out of, you know, some of these more highly palatable junk sweet foods because I don't want to put them on a pedestal. You know, as far as my, my four year old son is concerned, uh, broccoli is is the same thing as uh, a cupcake, you know, because I treat them sort of equally. I don't make a huge deal about when he does get to go have a cupcake at, at someone's house. But I also don't make a big deal about broccoli either. It's just a food that we have, you know, it's on his plate. If he eats it, great. And he normally does. And if he doesn't want to eat it that day, that's okay, too. I know that I'm offering enough of those healthy foods as often as possible in our mealtime that depending on what he eats, he's, he's going to get the nutrition that he needs. Wow. Wow. We Hold really on. encourage broccoli as a cupcake. I just I just want to like take a second here and just like let that soak in. That may be one of the most profound things that has ever been said on this show. I just need a moment to compose myself. Put that, that on a magical. bumper sticker. Oh, <laughs> I mean it's, but but if you take the emotion out of it, you know, so many of us tend to like hype up some of these these items. And then we also tend to really hype up in, in a different way and like pressure, like you need to eat this. I I, I want you to try it. You know, then it, there's a lot of there's a lot of messaging in that subliminally, subliminally to our kids, right? They learn that like, oh, mom makes a really big deal about um, wanting me to eat my broccoli. Hmm, she must really want me to do that. There's a control issue, especially with toddlers. And gosh, she's making a really big deal about having this this sweet or this you know cake or it's all about this excitement. That's also a lot of really you know subliminal messages on like, oh wow, she doesn't make this big of a deal when it comes to serving that farro salad. Uh, there must be something here, and that's a lot of times how kids learn these like good foods and bad foods. Um, but it really doesn't help them when it comes to to choosing what foods they need for their body. You know, sort of letting them have those experiences is also really helpful, right? I mean, I. My son's still a little bit young to have a lot of these in-depth conversations, but at some time soon, he's going to realize that like, oh yeah, I feel different when I eat that that cookie versus when I eat that broccoli and trying to allow them to sort of learn how these foods work in their body. That's also a lot of really powerful messaging when it comes to choosing these foods themselves more often as they get older. Whitney, I didn't mean to, to cut you off there. I just got excited about broccoli and cupcakes. <laughs> No worries. Um, I can't remember what I was about to say. <laughs> but I was going to also say it's really important to remember where kids' brains are at at this early age, too. They don't have impulse control. They don't have that higher level reasoning to really wrap their heads around uh, nutritious foods versus sweets. Like Alex said, what's really going on in their mind at this age is this, this control, this power struggle. Um, and you just don't want to engage in that with kids. And again, the, the research shows that it doesn't pay off in the long run. Now, at the Physicians Committee, we have what's called the power plate, all right? And that's just kind of our answer to, you know, how people should be stacking their plate up, what they should be eating in the day. You guys put together something geared specifically toward children, and you call it the PB3 plate. So let me go ahead and pull this thing up. I love this thing, first of all. <laughs> this is on your website, plantbasedjuniors.com. And I am absolutely in love with this graphic. One, because it's so fun, and two... It is healthy as all get up, right? Like this is this is part of the appeal to children that we were talking about. 
Yeah, it's pretty cute, right? It is. <laughs> we 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 actually both have this hanging on our refrigerator so that we can easily plan meals. And and that's that's the, what the goal was in Alex and I creating this was to take the guesswork out of meal planning for parents to give them an easy visual tool that they can look at and see how can I meet all of my kids' nutrient needs um, without without a ton of uh, critical thinking every time I want to make a meal. Um, so you can download this for free on our website. But essentially, it divides the plate and to three categories. We've got our legumes, nuts, and seeds. So that's where your beans, your tofu, your soy foods are. We've got our grains and starches, and we've got our fruits and veggies. And what's a little bit different from this plate versus some other plates you might have seen, like the USDA My Plate, um, or for instance, the Harvard plate, is that instead of dedicating half the plate to fruits and vegetables, we've cut it down to a third. And that's for a very important reason. We love fruits and vegetables. We want to get kids eating tons of them. Uh, but fruits and vegetables are a lot lower in fat and calories than the other categories. And for babies and toddlers especially, but kids in general as well, they need a ton of fat. And so that's one of the really big differences between an ideal plant-based diet for a child and an ideal plant-based diet for an adult is this fat need. Kids need about 35 to 40 percent of their their calories coming from fat, whereas adults, you know, it can vary a lot more. And depending on your health conditions, um, if you're trying to avoid heart disease or if you're trying to lose weight, that may be a time that you'd want to cut back on fat in your diet. But for kids, we need lots of fat. The more fat, the better. So we actually have fat at the center of our plate, um, encouraging parents to incorporate it into all meals. But that's the reason that we have fruits and vegetables a little bit smaller is for that nutrient um, nutrient density issue is that while all of these foods are nutrient dense, some of them, um, and really plant foods in general, are a lot less calorically dense and babies need calories and fat to thrive. Right. Alex, what's the balance there? Because obesity among children is it's an epidemic as much as it is among adults, practically. So where is that balance between making sure that they get enough, quote unquote, healthy fat versus going overboard with that standard Western diet? Yeah, well, and, and as you can see here, the the types of foods that we're recommending are really different, right? So we're talking about getting fats from from plant based sources versus more highly saturated, high cholesterol, uh, animal based sources. We're really looking at things like avocados, like nuts, like seeds, like cooking in heart healthy oils, like olive oil, uh, and we're also focusing on things that also help. Uh, so you know, we have a third of the plate dedicated to legumes, right? So we really are big on uh, consuming things like beans and lentils and soy based foods, uh, you'll also see our sort of grains and starches. And you know, especially as our kids get older, we really want to focus on those being all from from whole grain sources. So, um, you know, obviously, yes, we're concerned about uh, these sort of, you know, lifestyle diseases that sometimes we're seeing even instances younger and younger. Uh, but but where we get these nutrients really matters. And, and the research also shows that that those plant based sources are going to be a much different uh, risk factor than when it comes to getting them from from those animal based foods. Yeah, an important thing to remember is that, yes, while the uh, obesity numbers are rising in children, these are really tied to a Western diet. And so if we look at the literature comparing kids on plant-based diets to kids on Western diets, we see that they have much lower rates of obesity and typically have healthier body weights as well. Now, you both have mentioned chronic disease, and I would imagine as a parent, I'm not a parent myself, but as a parent, I would imagine that there is... Uh, a great deal to be said for setting your child up for long-term health in life and knowing that you're doing everything in your power to lower the risk of heart disease, of cancer, you know, diabetes, so many of these chronic issues that just claim so many needless lives every year. Do you, uh, Whitney, sleep a little bit easier at night and, and take pride in the fact that you really are doing something great here? I do. Absolutely. I mean, Chronic disease prevention is really what led me as, as an adult to eating this way. And while we don't have a ton of solid research on chronic disease um, and plant-based diets in kids, the trends that we see um, with children that are eating plant-based diets are pointing towards um, that they have the same benefits as, as for adults. So again, we see the ki kids having healthier body weights, lower risk of obesity. We see lower cholesterol levels. We see that plant-based kids tend to eat uh, more fruits and vegetables, which as we've been talking about all throughout the show, um, 
establishing healthy eating patterns early in life is going to increase the chances that a kid's going to have lifelong positive eating habits. And we know that adults who eat more fruits and vegetables have lower rates of chronic disease. So I, I definitely take pride in knowing that my children are getting the best start that they can in their relationship with food. Alex, I, I would imagine it's much the same for you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that one thing that's really important uh, that we that we sort of touched on a little bit is this this early taste preference, right? So so taste preferences are really formed uh, sort of in those those older infancy years, but really sort of throughout the toddlerhood, a little bit less into the preschool and, and older kid years. So the more that we can introduce these foods as normal, the more that, that our kids are sort of understanding that this is what food is, uh, the more that ideally they're going to be continuing to choose these foods as they get older. And I think that is one of the, the biggest, you know, things on, on my end is that I know that, you know, my, my, both my kids get so excited when we're having, you know, tofu stir fry. And that's because that's what they've been, that's what they've been exposed to. You know, I, I sort of um, balk at the myth that there's, or this idea that there is something called kid food, you know, kid food is just really highly palatable, right? It's something that's really enjoyable on that first bite. And some of these other plant-based foods sometimes take a little bit more to uh, to, to like, uh, just because sometimes they tend to be a little bit more bitter, especially if we're talking about things like vegetables. But we know that the more that we introduce these foods to our kids, the more they become part of the family meal, the, the less, the more that goes away. And so I think really sort of setting them up to say that these are foods that you like, that you enjoy eating, um, you know, is, is really the, the best thing that I can do as a parent. I also want to add that, well, this pattern of eating is so important to us personally and for setting our kids up for a healthy lifestyle. I think in the bigger picture, it makes me so much more uh, hopeful about the future of the planet and the future that we're going to be leaving our children a planet that's actually sustainable because of these eating patterns and that everyone will be able to thrive on. Because if we continue on the route that we're going on um, with the increased meat consumption, increased um, out output from the animal agriculture sector, there isn't going to be a future for our children. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, that's something that more and more people are beginning to comprehend, whether mm -hmm. or not they are eating a plant based diet is actually seeing the impact of the way that society by and large is eating and the way that we consume and process and manufacture and ship and everything that goes into it with yeah. our food and, and just the devastating impact that it's it's currently having. But uh, with the time that we have left, I want to put into practice a lot of what it is that we've already talked about. So I am curious, uh, Whitney, we'll start with you. What are the must have foods in your pantry? What do you always make sure that you have on hand at all times? Okay. I'd say number one is a legume pasta. So they've got all these pastas out there that are bean based, whether they're made from red lentils or, or, uh, chickpeas or, or soy or, all the different beans. I think they've got a new pasta for every bean. They've even got like cauliflower pasta now. That, that's a must have in my house. Um, and that's because my son will pretty much eat pasta in any form. And the legumes are such a great source of protein and iron specifically. Whole grains are as well, um, but the legumes are a little bit richer. And we definitely wanna see you getting legumes in at least two to three times a day. Um, so that's a typical kid-friendly food that most kids will accept. Uh, chickpeas are huge and not in the traditional form, because if I just put a chickpea on, on my son's plate, he's probably going to throw it at me. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Alex and I take chickpeas and we use them to make so many amazing kid, kid friendly. And I say kid friendly foods, what, whereas we, we do try to get our kids to eat things that aren't typical kid foods, but kid friendly means they're usually going to be a slam dunk. Um, we use chickpeas to make things like chickpea tuna salad. Um, we use chickpeas in our uh, protein balls. So they, we've got this recipe that we've adapted in a few different ways. One of them's got carrots in it. The other one has blueberries and they're basically balls that are made of chickpeas and oats and some nut butter. And they're an awesome, easy, portable snack for kids. Uh, what else do we use? We use chickpeas in our baby led weaning muffins. So this is something you can give your baby right at six months that is going to fulfill all of their main nutrient needs, again, for like protein, iron, healthy fat. We've even got some spinach in those. Um, 
oats. I've already mentioned oats a couple of times. Those are definitely a staple in my house. I would say they probably make up like 50% of my individual diet, but uh, we use oats in like oat bakes for breakfast. Um, we use them in, in waffles and in pancakes. Um, I even use them in savory dishes. They're another typical food that kids will very easily accept at an early age and that are again, rich in protein and iron and zinc and all these great things for kids. Um, what else do we have? Alex, what are some of your... Yeah, I would say uh, definitely all of those. We we also do a lot of broccoli and cauliflower in my house. Uh, my kids, that's sort of their their favorite or preferred vegetables. Um, I roast a lot of veggies too. Um, so I do a lot of like butternut squash fries or sweet potato fries. Uh, sometimes I'll do carrot fries and sort of mix them all together. So they sort of like that all the, all the root veggies at once. Um, that's a huge thing that we eat a lot of hummus. Um, both my kids love hummus. I make like hummus uh, tortillas. Uh, for my son, I take to preschool. We do a lot of edamame. Um, what else do we do? I want to throw tofu in the mix. Yeah, you tofu, edamame, a really tofu. sweet foods in general. And to circle back to the myths we were talking about earlier, that's probably one of the biggest myth questions we get from parents is whether or not soy is healthy for kids. Um, quick answer, spoiler alert, it is definitely healthy for kids. And we go way in depth into it in articles on our blog if you want to read more about it. But tofu is such a great option for kids because it's a really nice texture that, again, kids can have starting right at six months that they're most likely to accept. And it's also versatile in taste. So it really takes on the flavor of whatever that you put on there. And then uh, it's also a really great source of nutrition, again, with our protein, our healthy omega-3 fats, um, our iron, our zinc, our calcium. So that is definitely a staple in my house. Yeah. That's pretty cool that you guys, I mean, your dietitian banner is just the flying so, <laughs> so fantastically right now. You're, you're breaking it down by particular food and the nutrients that come with it like that. I love that so much. Uh, last question here that I have for you is the typical standard American lifestyle is busy as anything. Goodness gracious. Yeah. So I think that that may be one of the barriers for a number of people who want to feed their child a healthier diet, but are like, I just don't have all the time to invest in cooking right now and spending all that time in the kitchen. So what are some ways, Alex, that somebody can really kind of speed up this process and not have to spend hours in the kitchen every single day, but still make sure that their kids eating as healthy of a diet as possible? Yeah. So, so the big thing I will say is that we don't have to fear some of these healthier processed foods, right? So things like rolled oats or canned beans or canned lentils or some of the various pastas that Whitney uh, was just talking about. Um, you know, I can buy at my local store, like tofu that's already marinated and, you know, yummy spices. So a lot of those things are really convenient and I can get dinner on the table in, you know, 10 minutes, especially if I'm buying a bag of, let's say, you know, pre-cut broccoli florets, I can, you know, throw everything together and I can have a healthy, uh, you know, sort of PB3 plate meal in, in 10, 15 minutes. And, and that feels really good, especially because I am busy, you know, my, my husband works full time, so do I. So our, our time for actual meal prep tends to feel like it's getting uh, less and less by the day. Um, the other big thing that we're a proponent of is this idea of batch cooking. So kind of similar to meal planning or meal prep, uh, but batch cooking is really this idea that you make perhaps one or two big ingredients in the beginning of the week and then kind of repurpose them a few different ways uh, throughout the week to create new different meals. And we actually have a, a guide on our, our website that's what's called the, our batch cook ebook that really shows you how to do this. So for example, you know, we show you how to make uh, a big batch of beans in the instant pot and then you're kind of repurposing those beans into burgers, into tacos, um, into, you know, a, a soup and then into like a chili mac. So you're sort of making this thing once and then just grabbing a few different ingredients uh, in a short amount of time, you're able to sort of really repurpose uh, that sort of meal prep, that cooking that you did all over the weekend. Whitney, do you have any quick tips? I just want to add when we're talking about the processed foods too, Alex and I obviously advocate for as, as much of a whole foods uh, diet as possible. And especially under the age of two, we really recommend restricting sugar and salt. But again, you have to weigh that against being a busy parent and dealing with picky kids. So there's a phrase that Alex and I always like to share, and it says, it's not nutrition unless it's eaten. So if you're going to slap a, a piece of tofu on your child's plate with absolutely um, no seasoning, and they're not going to eat it, then they're not going to get any of the nutrition from it. 
if you can sprinkle a little salt on there and it encourages them to eat it, then that's great. Then they're actually going to get all the nutrients from it. Yes, we don't want them eating a lot of these highly processed foods, a lot of the salt, a lot of the sugar in the long run. But sometimes you have to modify your decisions a little bit to get to the place that you're working towards, if that makes sense. So while we wouldn't always want to serve carrots with um, with maybe a highly processed ranch dressing or even a vegan ranch dressing for, for that uh, matter, if that's going to get your kid to eat the carrot, then maybe in the short term, we start there and then we work towards the goal that we're trying to get towards. Exactly. Yeah, that sounds uh, very similar to anyone who's trying to adopt a plant-based diet is uh, you don't necessarily need to go all in overnight. Mm -hmm. um, you can just kind of work your way gradually. And I, I think that it depends largely on the individual, like what works best for them. If they are a person who can go cold tofu and just go hard straight <laughs> out of the bay <laughs> and do that. But if, if you need to wean yourself off and take that more gradual approach, that works for other people as well. But the bottom line is what you guys have just told us here over the past 40 minutes is that you can feed your child a healthier diet, no question about it, no ifs, ands, or buts. This can happen, and it is healthy, and it is safe, and uh, and you guys are just fantastic. So thank you guys so very thank much. You. The book is The Plant-Based Baby and Toddler, Your Complete Feeding Guide for Six Months to Three Years. Going all the way up to the age of three, you guys did a lot of homework on this. And we want to see it actually does cover zero to six months as well, and we have information in there for breastfeeding mamas on postpartum nutrition. Well, we will bring you back and talk uh, specifically about that. That's another hot topic. Honestly, we get a ton of email about that. So thank you so very much for bringing that up as well. There's a link to pick up the book in the show description and in the episode notes. So go ahead and pick up your copy today. Alex, Whitney, thank you both so very much. Check out plantbasedjuniors.com. You guys are real delights. Thank you so much for having us. If you feel like you've raised your health IQ by a couple of points, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and leave a nice comment below. And to hear the entire interview, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your shows from and subscribe to the exam room by the Physicians Committee. And please leave a five-star rating.